Thank you so much for being here. I know it's busy. Earnings are soon. Um, so as Patty mentioned, I wrote this profile of you for our most powerful women issue. And I talked to so many of the people that you've worked with, uh, John Mack, um, Hank Paulson. And one thing that really struck me when in my reporting was a comment made by GE CEO Jeff Immel. And what he said is, Ruth is the only person who can give me bad news and I'll still like her afterwards. <laughs> so with that in mind, what's the secret to giving a Fortune 500 CEO bad news? Well, first, I think Jeff is an extraordinary leader. He's absolutely terrific. Uh, but in terms of good news and bad news, my view is you have to anchor your views in data. And once you anchor it in data, the rest will follow. And I think what's really notable is when um, I read Eric Schmidt's book well before I had, I had any idea that I'd end up at Google. Um, in his book, he talks about just that. Anchor, anchor your point of view in data and that will frame the discussion and the rest will follow. I think it's a really important uh, point. I think the other really important point with good news or bad news, bad news is inevitable. It happens at some point to all of us. Um, deliver it quickly, concisely, be blunt, be direct, and then great leaders can take that information and they can act on it. Those are probably the two points. Um, I want to switch a little bit to what Patty mentioned, which is you took on a new role uh, at Alphabet and Google a little over a year ago. You left a nearly 20-year career um, on Wall Street, uh, most recently as a CFO of, of Morgan Stanley, to join Google as CFO. Uh, besides maybe a more relaxed dress code of hoodies and, and uh, sneakers, what's been the biggest change for you? Well, the biggest change is how fun it is in tech compared to financial <laughs> services. I apologize to you and financial services. I loved my time at Morgan Stanley. I'm so grateful I, I had that time. But it is a lot of fun. There's nothing quite like Google. I mean, what, what Larry and Sergey created, we have thousands of geniuses walking around with the mission to improve the lives of billions. And it's quite extraordinary. Um, you know, when you look at all that's available with access to information, when you look at what's going on with mobile, when you look at the trends in YouTube, when you look at what we can do with driverless cars to save lives, what we are doing with our life sciences business early, it's just, it's, it's a ton of fun. You've stepped in and quickly, you know, were thrown into this restructuring uh, of the company. Um, and Wall Street loves it. I mean, your stock is up more than 30% since the restructuring. Your stock actually hit all-time highs yesterday. Uh, but there are some reports of challenges that have been uh, taken place. You know, there's uh, executive uh, leaves. There's a little bit of, there's reports of layoffs. There's, um, you know, more emphasis on cost cutting. Uh, what's, what's real here? Well, our view is that, that the move from Google to Alphabet has been really positive for us. You know, if you go back to what was the key impetus, and we talk about this a lot, it really goes back to something Larry said years ago, which we repeated when we announced Alphabet, which is that incrementalism leads to irrelevance. And he added, especially in technology, where change is revolutionary, not evolutionary. But I would say from my time as a banker working across a lot of industries, that's a very accurate and important thing to remember. Incrementalism leads to irrelevance. So what we have, what we wanted is a structure that mirrors that ambition, that encourages our leaders to actually not do the incremental, but to make the big bets. And we talk about it a lot that some of our biggest bets are in Google. So we have big bets within Google, and then we have what we call the other bets. And what we've done is create a governance structure around it that creates a transparency, not just externally, for investors, but very importantly, internally, with respect to the resources that are put behind each one of these bets. And we and that's tough. I mean, that took a, a, a lot of effort to get the kind of data and granularity down to the business leader level so that they can assess what bets are they making, resources behind it, and then really recalibrate, reallocate to make sure that we're putting our our weight behind those, those biggest bets. And we've established technical and, and business and financial milestones around a number of them. So again, there's a level of accountability that helps us assess where we are on this journey. And 
what we're looking to do is, is really slow the rate of growth of expenses, but we're continuing to invest meaningfully in the business because we do have this breadth of opportunity. And I, the way I've, I've described it is I look at Google and a big surprise for me is how early stage Google actually is when you go back to some of the things I've already mentioned, what's going on with mobile, mobile usage, YouTube, you know, it's kind of like Google is, um, has, is, has quite a, a ways to go. And we're building the next, the next waves, the next big um, engines for, for the business. And so, again, there's been a lot of granularity that's gone into the way we run it. We're continuing to invest meaningfully because we believe that's the way to really lay the foundation for long-term growth. So one thing you mentioned within that was that you know these you're giving more data to some of these business right. leaders, whether they be within Alphabet or within Core Google. Could you give me an example of what that looks like? Well, at the highest level, it's really taking the the full P and L and breaking it down to the so that people have greater transparency within their business. And that and wasn't at, happening before. At, at we're taking it. What's intriguing to me, and I found this in my prior life, is when you give people more transparency, they ask for more data. And those, the data are their tools. They're their tools, it's their dashboard, it's their cockpit, whatever you wanna call it, that helps them better assess where can I make trade-offs. So I talk a lot about the value of providing that kind of data and granularity so that we can ask leaders, how do you best self-fund? How do you self-fund the growth opportunities? My view very strongly is I'm working with brilliant engineers and leaders. They will have a better sense of the priorities than, than I ever could. What I can do is give them the tools so they can assess within this large portfolio, where would they take resources from to fuel the, the, the bigger opportunities and what trade-offs can they make? Um, and so it's really that level of granularity. The milestones are really helpful. Collectively, we discuss what are the technical milestones you think you can achieve in a certain period of time, recognizing we're on a long journey whether technical or business, and how, what progress are you making against those? And those help pace our, 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 our um, gate, the pace of investment that we're making. Comes back to data, keep coming back to data. <laughs> That's been a, a theme, I think, uh, in the past few days. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit. Uh, once again, going back to the reporting that I did for the past few months, um, one thing that John Mack and Hank Paulson both said very clearly, you are the hardest worker that they know. And in my research, both of those times that you worked for both Mac and Paulson, you had small children. I'm actually pregnant with my second child. I realize the demands of children and family plus balancing a career. How do you manage to, to do all of it? Well, one thing is, um, you use the word balance. I don't like the word balance. I always talk about the importance of mix because I think the word balance <laughs> Makes us think you somehow can get there, and if you don't, there's something wrong with you. You can't get balance. It's a trap word. I think you have to get um, a mix in your life of things that really are important to you. And I think the you know a, a great um, metaphor is a kaleidoscope. That it's different colors of glass, different shapes of glass. They move all the time, and it's really the fact that it's that mix that makes life so beautiful. Um, and for me. I love work, and so work is energizing. Uh, and I've always included my children, our children, um, in, in my life. So one, I, I'm very fortunate. I have a fantastic partner, my husband of 33 years, um, is a big partner in, in this with me. He's, he's a lawyer and has a full work schedule as well, but we're a team, and that's really important. And then we include the kids in what we do at work. I mean, simple things like, you know, when I was a banker and the kids were young, um, if we were doing an IPO, one thing I would do is check where the markets were in Asia to try and gauge where they would be in the U.S. So we'd play games with the globe and kind of what happens and what do, what happens with the clock. Or we'd look at CNBC and the different colors and what are the different colors mean. I mean, these are silly little stories, but life gets integrated. It's one. It's not two different things, and you try and keep it balanced. And my view very strongly is if you don't have a full, real, rich life, you're going to burn out on work. So you absolutely have to. So congratulations on the second. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, not, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not always easy, of course, with children. But you've, you've um, been able to do it. And, and you've also been able to do something really amazing, which is kick cancer's butt two separate times, yeah. um, which is <laughs> incredible. What was 
that time like for you? Uh, terrifying. It was completely and utterly terrifying. Um, the first time I was diagnosed with cancer, the kids were very little. They were five, seven, and nine. And uh, my husband and I sat down with them, and um, he said, you know, mommy's sick, and she's going to take some very strong medicine, and her hair will fall out. She'll be bald, but then she'll be okay. And without missing a beat, my middle kid said, can we get a black bell pen and draw a line on her head and call her, <laughs> call her butthead? That was her. <laughs> so he set the tone. He set the tone, which is we are going to just laugh and power through this thing. And, you know, the thing that really was terrifying was looking at these little kids and wondering where, whether I was going to be there for their, their really important moments in life and whether I had lived the life I wanted. Like, I didn't know how long I had. And what was um, great, and there are silver linings from these god-awful things that happen in life, is I realized that I had no regrets. I had lived the kind of life I wanted. I had a wonderful husband, amazing kids. I loved my career. I hadn't punted on anything. And I think that's a really important point because too often I hear women say, well, I'll just wait until I get to this level or the next level. And you can't do that. I think if there's something you want to go, go out and do it. And that's a really important message because the worst that's going to happen is it doesn't work or it doesn't work as well as you want. But you can't live a life with regrets. And I do firmly believe that we can have it all. It's not easy, but, you know, go, go live the life that you want. And that, there was a calm that came about me as a result. It's kind of like, I don't have anything on my bucket list. Um, and so that... That was really cool, and fortunately with medical technology, I am fine, and I think it's for all of you who uh, have friends or are dealing with it, you know, medical technology is incredible, and I'm grateful to it. So we're all, all good. Uh, I'm going to take some questions uh, just in a minute, uh, but I want to talk about a topic that obviously has come up a lot in the past few days and is basically plastered all over the news, which is the election. Um, you've been a very public supporter of H Hillary Clinton both in 2012 and, of course, uh, in this election. Um, what are your feelings right now, and where do you stand? Uh, well, first, um, Google is an, a neutral information platform. That's very important to us. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll comment on, on my, th uh, my views, you know, and, and they do go back a long way with, with Hillary, back to before she was Senator of New York when I was living in New York. Uh, and, um, and I've been a big, a big supporter since then. I, I actually think a lot of the trash talk that we've seen in both the primary and general election is derived from the fact that she's a woman. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's quite troubling. Uh, but when you ask about the, you know, substantive policy issues, I think we need somebody who's really serious about policy, and she is, when you look at her stance on uh, whether it's immigration or infrastructure investment or climate change or education. Uh, it's, again, rooted in, in data and uh, very thoughtful and, very importantly, on social policy issues. I mean, she's been devoted for, for decades, and that's why I go back to well before I joined Google Alphabet. Are there any policy issues? Oh. <laughs> Any policy issues for you that you're particularly excited about for the for the coming election? Well, I think we've we've just talked about a breadth of them. I think one of the you know key key issues is infrastructure investment. It addresses so many of the needs that our country has. Um, it's something I've been focused on again since I was at at Morgan Stanley. When you look at uh, at rising inequality and the need for job creation, you look at how inexpensive capital is. You look at the need for long term capital oppor investment opportunities, and you look at our crumbling infrastructure, there's a real opportunity there. But I think it's, there's a plethora, unfortunately, of issues to deal with. Education is one that is very core to us at Google. We spend a lot of time actually giving, giving back, supplying schools with, with Chromebooks, um, with apps so that kids in underprivileged schools actually have the opportunity to have access to the kind of tools that are so important in learning. We do a lot with training girls on coding, so I think education is an important platform as well. I want to open it up to questions, and if anyone has a, has one. Oh, it looks like there's one right here. Hi, Michelle Seitz. I lead a global money management firm, William Blair. Um, I'm just curious, given your background both on Wall Street and now a, a bit of time uh, in Silicon Valley, can you talk about how you think technology, fast forward five plus years, will start to revolutionize 
uh, Wall Street and other money management firms. They've, they've toyed with FinTech, but not really in revolutionary business model changing ways. Can you forecast to the degree that you've given that some thought? I think one, one area uh, that's so important is the way we all work. My, the way I work is fundamentally transformed, moving from Wall Street to Google, now Alphabet. I live in the cloud. I've got my Chromebook. I don't really need an office. I work from, walk from space to space. I have kind of three different conference rooms that I hang out in. But most important, our tools are collaborative tools. And what that does for the team is, one, it increases efficiency incredibly, but it also empowers younger people. They're involved in the creation. And I think that's a really valuable element of how the work, work will, will change. It gives you efficiency and it gives you effectiveness. The other really important change is how machine learning is being applied to everything that we're doing. So when it relates to, you asked specifically about finance, but in each one of our industries, what we're able to do is actually take data um, and, and with machine learning identify better patterns, ways to deal with whether it's risk management or other tools that you need. And there's an ability to actually increase effectiveness again by moving to the cloud. So I think that's probably one of the most important things, not just in financial services, but across industries. In life sciences, as an example, we can use machine learning to data sets to look at drug discovery in the process and see if there were errors made. So again, machine learning being very important there. Um, whether other products and tools will develop, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to others. But I think this, this move to the cloud in the revolutionary way we can all work is really important. Anyone else? Oh, right here. Hi, Ruth. Karen Feinerman. Do you find it difficult with your history as a CFO to deal with the tension of cost cutting and maintaining sort of uh, expense control? with the other parts of the business that are much more speculative by design. We talked a little bit about data, but do you find that difficult dealing with those two parts of the business? So you both use the term cost cutting, and I think what's really important is, and I, I've said this on a number of, of earnings calls, so I'm glad you brought it up. We are very focused on long-term revenue growth. We have been and we continue to be. And that goes very much with my comment that incrementalism leads to irrelevance. We need to keep investing in the drivers of long-term revenue growth, and we are. But as I've also said on, on some earnings calls, that doesn't give us a pass on expense management. So what we've been doing is slowing the rate of growth of expenses and try and ensure that we're investing those precious resources behind the greatest opportunities. And so this is really a prioritization effort. One of the things that we talk a lot about at Alphabet, at Google, is too few resources or too many resources can each actually handicap ability to be agile and creative and nimble. And what you really need is to torque it so that you can actually get to that both creative and energy, you know, that creative energetic position. And, and you don't want to be over, overdoing it. It kind of, kind of creates a bit of a numbing. And so that's why I said this whole notion of take data, prioritize, know your key priorities, and make some tougher calls to, to put the resources, maximize resources above um, uh, around the greatest ones. And, and that's really what we've been spending our time doing. We have to be investing in the, in the key opportunities for the medium and longer term if we're going to be able to continue to drive the kinds of performance that we know is possible given the breadth of opportunities that we're addressing. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Great to it. be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you.